So like, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, how are you doing? I'm I'm okay. I mean, I'm, I mean, it's quite a tough semester. So much angst on the ground. That's why I thought, you know, like trying to read John Paul Sartre will be a good idea now, you know, try to yeah. find some kind of meaning out of this meaninglessness. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm coming here as a kind of like, you no know, kind of layman, not much expertise on, on this like person. Uh, yes. I'm a philosopher, his writings, um, but I know here and there stuff. So, I mean, it's like, you know, but also my idea is like to give something to the humanities so that they can learn something in an easy way rather than very complex, you know all those terminology and everything. So, so, I mean, for you, like what will be the good starting point when you want to talk about Jan Paul Sartre? Well, I think a really good starting point is the notion of responsibility that he has. And one of the chapters in my book is about that. And I like to use a really short piece he wrote uh, called The Republic of Silence, mm. uh, which was about France under German occupation. Mm. And it starts off with a really provocative first sentence. We were never more free than under the German occupation. Now, that's a crazy statement if mm. taken literally. But when he explains what he means by it. So, the, by the way, this is one of the difficulties with Sartre. He was not only a philosopher, but also a novelist and a playwright. So he was also a mm. literary artist. And mm. so even when he's writing something philosophical, he uses, you know, drama and irony and things like that. And that sometimes gets in the way of understanding, because obviously it's not literally true you know, that the French were mm. freer under mm. the Germans. So as he goes on to explain it, what he means was <clears throat> what he meant was their consciousness of freedom was much higher because the stakes were so high. Uh, at any given moment, you might be arrested, you might be put in prison, you might be killed, you might be doing something that is uh, betraying other people who will suffer that fate. So everything you're doing is important. Everything has these consequences. So you have to really weigh out you know, what you're doing, what's the right thing to do. And you're responsible for that, responsible for the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. And so the argument that I make in my book, picking up from that, it's well known that Sartre was hugely influential in France uh, in the post-war period. Uh, he was incredibly widely read, widely appreciated. But many people take the view that <clears throat> the reason he was so successful is just that his ideas fit so well the, pe the peculiarities of that time and place. Mm. And so what I want to argue is we still are in that situation in one sense, namely that our actions or inactions have important consequences. It's not the same in that we, those of us who live a more privileged kind of life, we're not in danger of being executed or put in a concentration camp or a CIA black site or something like that. But there's still a lot of injustice in the world, a lot of suffering in the world, that we can either do something about or simply tolerate and not do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so Sartre emphasizes and tries to debunk all of the ways that people try to evade that responsibility. So mm -hmm. like one of them is by thinking they are not responsible for their inactions. I'm only responsible for my actions. You know, so, so long as I'm not killing anyone or assaulting anyone or stealing from anyone, I, I'm fine. You know, I, I'm living a good moral life. Mm. And Sartre would say, well, there's also the things that you're not doing that you could do. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to that. Mm. Uh, but but so that's one. So one way people try to evade their responsibility is they don't appreciate the extent to which we are responsible for our inactions, our omissions, if you were. Mm. So then another one is people will try to evade their responsibility by passively following the dictates of some kind of authority. So it could be religious, 
It mm. could be societal. These are sort of society's norms. Um, and Sartre's point would be, well, look, you are still responsible for uh, determining that those norms are defensible. Mm. So mm. you can't get off the hook that way. In Simply Sartre, I give the example, in the United States, there was a few years ago an intense debate about same-sex marriage. Mm. It did finally uh, resolve itself. The Supreme Court found that laws banning uh, same-sex marriage would be unconstitutional. But prior to that, there was quite an extensive political battle. Mm. And people who were against that often would say, hey, I'm not a bigot. You know, I'm not against uh, gays or anything like that, but it's the Bible, you know, the Bible, the book of Levit mm -hmm. Leviticus, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not me. You can't blame me. Mm -hmm. And the Sartrean point would be, yeah, but you're the one who decided that that's the approach to moral and political questions, that, that the book mm -hmm. of Leviticus is what determines it, you know, so you can't evade your responsibility in that way. Um, it, so, so, so that I think is sort of a major point. He wants to say that there's this kind of drama of responsibility in life that mm -hmm. people in comfortable circumstances try to evade. Now, having said that, I wanted to just circle back to the thing about omissions, because Sartre also admits it's not as if there's an easy answer to that about what what's mm -hmm. the best way to live one's life. Because he has a few different passages where he says there's so much injustice in the world, so much suffering, so so much pain, that if one devotes oneself to that, mm. one tends to be neglectful of the ethical obligations one has to those near to us, people we love, people who are near to us, spouses, children, neighbors, etc., on the other hand, if you kind of devote yourself to that realm, there's not enough time and energy to de mm. to devote to uh, these serious world problems. So it's not as if there's some easy answer. You know, he here's how you lead sort of a good life. But mm. I think he has the idea that a responsible person is someone who is really concerned for that, is not looking for an easy way out and sort of struggles with that to try to try to live up to one's responsibilities in both spheres as best one can. Mm, mm, so that I think mm. is a good starting point into okay. SART. Good. I mean, a couple of things came out from from your, you know, this introductory thing. Um, yeah. The people you, you kind of talked about, you know, people say that, oh, it's not my fault. It's, it's the is the like Bible or religion or like science like dictated me to mm -hmm. be this way? Um, is it linked to it like that that Satyan idea about bad faith? Oh yes, yeah. Uh, bad faith is a really interesting idea. So, as a first approximation, uh, what bad faith essentially is is self deception, mm. and um, uh, for Sartre. I mean, there are several sort of modalities of bad faith, but uh, one sort of, he, he tends to talk about it in terms of various dualities. So I'll just mention one of them, and it relates, I think, to what you're asking about. So in his book, Being and Nothingness, he talks about free, uh, 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 sorry, facticity and transcendence, where transcendence in this case is kind of a fancy word for freedom. So maybe I'll just use that, for freedom and facticity. Where, you know, freedom, that's, you know, where, where you get to choose what you're going to do. Facticity, what are the facts about me that maybe I didn't choose? I mean, I, I didn't choose when I was born or where I was born or, you know, you know things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, human reality involves both of those dimensions, our facticity and our freedom. And we frequently try to deceive ourselves by denying one or the other of those and defining ourselves just in terms of the one. Mm -hmm. So getting back to your question, that example of saying, oh, you can't blame me. It's not my fault. I'm just following the Bible or following mm -hmm. my culture or what have you. That's the denial of freedom. Mm -hmm. He's a, like I'm defining myself in terms of my facticity. Oh, I'm a Catholic or I'm an American. What, what can I do? You know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and people can sort of go back and forth on these things. So sometimes they deny their freedom. Sometimes they deny their facticity. Mm. So a good a example of how people deny their facticity 
is if someone does some horrible thing, mm. oftentimes uh, when they are apologizing for it, they'll say something like, oh, that's not me. You know, I, I'm not that. Everybody who knows me knows I'm not that kind of person. That doesn't count. That was an aberration, you know. Mm. I, I remember a really good example. I live near Chicago. And there was a case um, several years ago, it used to be the Chicago Cubs baseball team. They mm. were the only team in the major leagues that didn't have light. So they only played day games. Mm. And one time, you know, the fans were booing because the Cubs were, you know, in a big losing streak or what have you. Mm. And the manager just teed off on them after the game with a, an, an obscenity laden tirade. These effing bums who don't even have jobs. That's why they're able to come to, <laughs> to the field. They're, they're a bunch. They can stick it up my ass. They, you know, just go. We just went off on them. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that can easily get you fired. You you, you attack the fans. So then he apologized. The man's name was Lee Elia. And he said, that's not Lee Elia. Everyone who knows Lee Elia knows that he goes to church and loves people and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So he just sort of. It, it doesn't count. You know, it, it would have been different if he would have said that was me at my worst. I'm sorry. That That's the worst side of me that came out. But no, it's like it's not me at all. You know, mm -hmm. so um, so these are a couple of the modalities of bad faith. And mm -hmm. one of the big motivations for it, according to Sartre, is to deny responsibility. So here's Lee Elia trying to deny responsibility by denying his facticity. Whereas mm -hmm. in the other case we were talking about, oh, I'm not a bigot. I'm just following the Bible. You know, now mm -hmm. we're denying freedom. You know, my freedom to evaluate different mm -hmm. kinds of moral claims and assess them rationally rather than sort of blindly deciding to follow, you know, the mm -hmm. book of Leviticus in the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, am I right to say like in his book, like being in, nothingness i mean he's he kind of says us like don't feel bad about this 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 kind of existence and then you know the problem with the freedom but he he asked us to like celebrate the freedom you know the the real freedom so that um yeah yeah although that really only starts to come out at the end of the book um he he being in nothingness is often seen as a very gloomy and pessimistic mm -hmm. book because mm -hmm. he describes lots of really nasty stuff like he has a chapter on concrete relations with others mm -hmm. and it's just a big disaster you know mm -hmm. it talks about all the ways they fall apart and are problematic and so forth and it's really only at the end of the book that he suggests that what is going on is that people are in bad faith, essentially, and they need to uh, fully embrace their freedom. So let me give you an example. So like when he talks about love in that chapter on concrete relations, he has an interesting passage about vows, like as in a marriage vow, mm -hmm. where you know, people promise to love each other forever. And he says, but nobody would really be satisfied by their partner <laughs> staying with them just because of a vow. So if a partner said, you know, I'm kind of disinclined to continue loving you, but damn it, I took a vow and I'm a person of my word. So I'm going to stick it out and continue loving you out of an ethical obligation to keep my promise. No one wants that. Everyone wants to be loved freely. Hmm. But... People have anxiety about that because if the other person is free, they're also free to stop loving you and go away. Mm -hmm. So we want this contradictory situation where they are both free and bound simultaneously. And so this is why on Sartre's analysis, you know, there are so many problems. So it takes a, it takes a certain amount of courage. And in fact, in one passage, he says courage and more than courage. It takes courage to sort of fully embrace the idea of freedom because then things are not uh, settled and secure, which, of course, they aren't anyway. So it's sort yeah. of an acknowledgement of that. And this comes up in other areas as well. So um, I find, uh, probably you do as well in your teaching, how there are some students who are very annoyed if there's a question where there's not sort of a clearly defined right mm -hmm. answer that the professor could just get well here's the answer to this problem yeah. yeah 
I don't want to say that all students or even most of them are that way. I'm not trying to disparage mm -hmm. students in general, but there are some like that. Mm. Whereas I think from a Sartrean perspective, and I do agree, with, I don't agree with Sartre on everything, but I do agree with him on this point. Uh, from a Sartrean perspective, it's it's a wonderful thing if there are activities or projects that are open-ended and in principle can't be finished. So this is one what I think one of the good things about philosophy, one of the good things about science, one of the good things about art. I mean, I can't imagine someone saying, I have mastered music. There's nothing more to be learned. You know, no musician is going to tell you that. Mm -hmm. So you, you make all kinds of discoveries along the way if you're a musician, but mm -hmm. each new discovery opens up new things, new things to explore. So it's a never ending journey. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of philosophy. I've never heard, I mean, I, I don't think even the most arrogant philosopher, I don't think any of them, is, I've solved all the problems of philosophy. It's finished. It's done. Yeah, no, you know, no one thinks that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not as if you can't make progress. It's not as if you can't figure out the answers to some questions and eliminate some wrong answers and so on. But but all the progress you make, it sort of opens up new vistas. And so I think from a Sartrean perspective about freedom, this is something to embrace. You know, it's a project of doing rather than a project of sort of being in some settled, finished way. And so that's, I guess, sort of part of the lesson of being nothingness, that people want to be finished and settled mm. uh, so that they don't have to face these questions all the time. Mm. Uh, they don't have to face their responsibility. Uh, they want, you know, a break from that. So mm. a phrase that Sartre has used over and over again is we are condemned to be free yeah. because no matter what your situation is, there are always choices to be made. Mm. Uh, mm. There's no escaping that. Mm. Mm. I think that's that's very good good explanation. Um, I'm, I'm I'm trying to like touch a bit of Sartre as a person as well. So yeah. one, one of the things like I learned that. Uh, during the German occupation, he was he was imprisoned for nine months. Yeah, and during that time, he was reading Martin Heidegger. Uh, yeah, um, can you give us some insight about you know these two philosophers? Because it looks like Sartre was influenced by Martin Heidegger, but Heidegger also not sure like Sartre is doing the right thing. Um, well. So Heidegger was a, a, morally speaking, just a monster, just a horrible human being. Uh, so it's not just that he was a Nazi. Mm -hmm. And um, for a long time, when I first started <clears throat> getting interested in Sartre and other figures in the phenomenological existentialist tradition, including Heidegger. So this would have been when I was really young, like in the 1970s, when I started getting interested in this. There was this line about Heidegger, oh, he had this brief flirtation with Nazism because he was sort of naive politically, you know, so you know, don't let that sort of bother you. But now the information has really come mm. out that he just did a lot of really horrible things. He fully participated mm. in persecuting Jews who were at his university where he was rector, mm. even Husserl, the founder of phenomenology, mm. who originally had sort of been Heidegger's mentor, you know, he was Jewish mm. and Heidegger participated in the persecution of him. So Sartre liked certain ideas of Heidegger that he interpreted in sort of an existentialist way, which is not what he which Heidegger claims was not what he intended. Mm. Heidegger claimed he was doing this very deep kind of philosophy where it was all about, you know, the nature of being itself. You know, it was like the most abstract concept there can be. Um, whereas Sartre sort of took these ideas and kind of existentialized them. And part of the reason also why Heidegger probably didn't appreciate what Sartre did is that Sartre was attacked. One of the attacks on Sartre was that he had drawn some inspiration from the ideas of this guy who was a Nazi. And so Sartre said, well, you know, uh, the problem is Heidegger just had no character at all. It sort of it sort of went off on his character. And, you know, Heidegger knew about that. So naturally, Heidegger then thought, well, Sartre, you know, he's a no good philosopher, or doesn't understand anything and so on. But, it, you know, it is a kind of vexing question. Um, 
we face this issue a lot nowadays. One of the things that has happened in the contemporary world more and more is sort of we learn about the nasty beliefs, you know, of people we might have admired. It could be someone in the arts, a musician or a comedian or something. And you get into this question of, you know, can you separate the person from their art and so on? So that's kind of an issue with Heidegger. And then the man was, in fact, I'll tell you something funny about Heidegger. There's a um, a book called something like In the Existentialist Cafe, I think that's the title of it, came out a few years ago, a really good book, in my opinion, mm. written not for academics, written for regular readers, mm. Mm. just talking about the various existentialists. The author's name escapes me at the moment, but she I, I saw her speak one time. She's really a delightful, a delightful mm. person. And uh, uh, in that book, there's this anecdote she tells about how a poet was coming to uh, Heidegger's city where Heidegger was a professor. Uh, this poet was coming and he was going to be giving a lecture and a poetry reading. Hmm. And Heidegger took it upon himself to go around to the various uh, bookstores in town to request that they place this poet's book in a prominent place, like in the window. You know, he'll, he'll like seeing that. And then the author said, I tell this story because it's the only documented case in record of Heidegger doing something nice. <laughs> so that's <laughs> sort of the real slam. But but anyway, so back to your question about sort of the relation there, I guess the way I would sum it up, you know, Heidegger had these passages in his big book, Being and Time, where he says things like, he talks about authenticity and inauthenticity, where inauthenticity mm. is just passively following the crowd, not thinking for yourself, whereas mm. authenticity, you are doing that. Um, and, and, and other concepts like that, like there's authentic conversation versus idle chatter and gossip. And Heidegger always said in being, these are not moral concepts. I'm trying to articulate the nature of being. Mm. Sartre kind of took them over in their ethical sort of context, mm. and that's the relation between them. And I think those particular ideas are not especially infected with anti-Semitism or Nazism, although other aspects of Heidegger's thought uh, are. Um, yeah, so, so, so I guess that's what I'd say about that. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. Um, his relationship with Albert Camus. Um, yes, it seems like at one point they were close together. I think uh, Satra was writing something in his some kind of journal, which is called Combat. Uh, and then I think later they fell out. And yes. when Camus wrote the something called Rebel. Uh, the Rebel, yeah. Yeah. And then um, I think obviously, like, I think Satra is one of his like close friend made a critic of that book and Camus was not happy about that and then he wrote like directly to Sartre that you know yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that was an interesting an interesting episode mm. so I think what started to uh, uh, separate them was uh, Sartre's stand on the French colonial system in Algeria mm. And it's ironic that they would sort of be on opposite sides of that since Camus was Algerian. Mm -hmm. So you would think he would be much more sympathetic, uh, Camus would be, to the Algerian cause. Mm -hmm. uh, but he took sort of a more nuanced position, uh, uh, Camus did, where Sartre was really quite gung-ho about how mm -hmm. this is colonialism, this is oppression, the Algerians have the right to um, self-determination. Uh, and so on and so forth. And when Camus wrote that book, The Rebel, it was sort of all about, you know, nonviolence and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of, sort of not uh, taking a strong stand uh, against colonialism. It has to be this sort of more nuanced, nonviolent thing and so forth. And so Sartre was one of the editors of the journal that he and Simone de Beauvoir and Maurice Merleau-Ponty had started, Les Temps Modern, Modern Times. Um, and so 
they they felt they had to review the book because here Camus, you know, he's a major figure, a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> you know, you can't ignore it if you're the leading journal of ideas in France. So they had to review it. Sartre, because of his friendship with Camus, uh, requested that uh, his friend uh, Janson, Francois Janson, um, that he review it as kindly as he could, you know, sort of be, be honest, you know, but, but please, you know, don't go overboard with, <laughs> don't be overly mean, but as Sartre put it, the review was slashing and, you know, pointed out all kinds of errors, which he, Sartre said was easy to do. And then Camus, as you say, rather than responding to the reviewer, responds directly to Sartre, uh, so, and then, you know, Sartre, and, and a very angry, very personal kind of response, Sartre mm -hmm. responded in kind. So now they're both really down in the mud. It was not really a fun thing to observe. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Camus died, uh, died young in a, mm -hmm. in a car crash, I believe yeah. it was. Yeah. And Sartre then did write a very moving article sort of celebrating Camus' life and career, but that was after Camus was dead. So they never reconciled uh, while they were alive. So yeah, that was a very un unfortunate incident, I would say. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, um, and then it kind of mentioned about Simone de Beauvoir a bit. Um, um, it's a kind of lifelong relationship, uh, um, but also kind of complex relationship as well. Kind of complex? That's putting it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us some insight about these this two, you know, very intellectual people, you know, and then the way they live their lives? Yeah, it, well, it, it is very unusual. So they met when they were quite young, when they were still students. Um, and they loved each other. But they decided early on that they, 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 they wanted uh, to be together for it to be a long term project. Mm -hmm. But they also wanted to be free to have other romantic entanglements. Mm. And that's what they did. Uh, to some extent, it was a success because they were still together after mm -hmm. a fashion uh, when Sartre died. And Simone mm -hmm. de Beauvoir wrote a very moving book mm -hmm. about their relationship you know, after he died. Uh, so they, to some extent, considered what they had done to be a success. Mm -hmm. However, there definitely were difficulties and Beauvoir especially admitted that she did suffer from jealousy from time to time when Sartre was in another relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think Sartre so much had that. Um, but, uh, and, and I think, in, you know, in some ways what they did was admirable. In other ways, I think not. In particular, I think it probably wasn't that fair to these other people they had relationships with, because I think these other people would fall in love with them. Mm. And, you know, right from the start, it's this sort of secondary kind of thing. Mm. Um, but anyway, that's the romantic side of it. The intellectual side of it, uh, it, it is a more straightforwardly good story, in my view, because both of them worked on projects together and they both read and critiqued each other's work mm. and both greatly benefited from that. Mm. And Sartre was on record as saying, you know, he would not have been able to do all the things he did had mm. he not been able to discuss all of his ideas with Simone de Beauvoir. And he also said she was the only one who counted. So, mm. you know, if she said it's not good, didn't matter if other people thought it was, it goes in the trash and he has to try again. Mm. Conversely, if she did think it was good, then he would publish it and he didn't care whether other people liked it or not. That, in his mind, that proved it mm. was good. Mm. And um, uh, there, you probably know there's a lot of controversy now about trying to sort out who was responsible for what, you know? So, like various ideas of Sartre's, did he really get those from Simone and vice versa? And, you know, my view is they they clearly worked on everything together, mm. you know, so I think there's a lot of her ideas in his work and a lot of his ideas in her work. 
she was always very, very modest uh, to, to a fault, I think, where mm. she would say, oh, I'm not the philosopher, Sartre's the philosopher, and I'm just mm. using Sartre's ideas. So like the second sex, which is considered, mm. you know, one of the early classics of modern feminism, mm. you know, she says, well, I'm just sort of applying Sartre's ideas to the issue of gender and so on. Well, I think that's not completely true. I mean, I think there are some Sartrean ideas in there, but I think she was quite an original thinker as well. But anyway, that that's a scholarly controversy. You can just evaluate mm. the ideas on their merits, which I think is the more important thing to do. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the things you are saying, it looks like Sartre is almost like living that authentic life, which is like life with good faith rather than in like bad faith. Well, I, I I think he tried to, but I, I don't think he always succeeded. And I think he would admit he didn't always succeed. Uh, but yeah, he certainly tried to. I, I think we can say that. He mm. was very conscious of that, you know, that that, that was something he was committed to. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so will it be okay if we like bring one of his major works like Nausea? I mean, um because that's 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 the book more or less his like foundation of his philosophy um, and and like I still remember this like uh, the protagonist what's his name Rockin 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 Tan Rockin Tan um, yeah. um, it's it's quite depressing book but also it more or less tells that story about you know our existence it talks about freedom and then you know uh, the way we are condemned as well um, yeah uh, the, the only thing i want to disagree with is i don't know that i would say that is sort of foundational to his whole philosophy okay. I, I think you know some of it's there but some of it's not but okay. but it's certainly an important book there's no doubt about that yeah so like i mean what's your take of that book i mean uh, like what what kind of things like take away from that book so so i'll mention a couple of things so one thing i think it's about is you know, Sartre was very influenced by phenomenology and you know, philosophy mm. coming out of Edmund Husserl. And so uh, Husserl had the idea of intentionality and Sartre wrote an early essay on intentionality explicating Husserl's idea uh, in France. And so the idea of intentionality is it's, it's, it's uh, in the nature of consciousness to take an object through focusing. You know, we, we, uh, what, what, any mode of consciousness, whether it's perception, imagination, remembering, uh, whatever it might be, to focus on an object is to apprehend it in a certain way, to, rel to, to, to elevate some features to the foreground and relegate others to the background. So let's say, just to give a simple example, let's say there's an apple on a table. So to notice the apple, you have to focus on the apple and not the other things on the table. Mm -hmm. And typically you're going to be focusing on it in a certain way because there's an infinite number of attributes that it has. So you could be noticing its size, its color, its shape, mm -hmm. or you could be thinking about, you know, it's an object from the grocery store or it's part of the economic system or it's, there, there are any, or you think about the history of it. There are all sorts of ways of conceptualizing it. And the world doesn't dictate to us how to conceptualize it, how to focus on it. That's sort of up to us. Mm. And so what happens in the novel Nausea, Sartre dramatizes this point by having this capacity of focusing break down in this central character. So mm. there's the famous scene where he's looking at the roots of a chestnut tree, yeah. and it just seems like this massive thing sort of devoid of any kind of meaningful you know content mm -hmm. so part of the novel is about that and then relatedly there's the idea that life as it is lived so, so, so let me back up so when you're looking at things getting back to the intentionality there's this sort of idea of what's important and meaningful and what is not so like if you're interested oh here's an example there's a famous example in being in nothingness of you encounter a crag, a big sort of cliff in the countryside. And he says, if you're a farmer looking to plow the field, you immediately see this as an obstacle that needs to be cleared away. 
If on the other hand, you desire to get a high vantage point to look at the countryside, it's a valuable aid. I can climb it and get way up there. If you are an artist, you might just be looking at it aesthetically, looking at the mm -hmm. pleasing features of it. Maybe it's something that would be in a landscape painting. So as we go through life, we're constantly elevating some features of things to the foreground, others to the background. This sort of breaks down in Rokantan's experience. Now, here, here I'm going to get to this other part of the novel that I think is sort of one of the main things Sartre was uh, doing with that novel, is ordinary life as it is lived is full of sort of inessential, not particularly meaningful uh, stuff. Mm. So like if you climb up a flight of stairs, it's not interesting exactly how many stairs there were. Was it 11? Was it nine? Who cares? It's not important. Mm. So life as it's lived is full of all this inessential sort of meaningless stuff. Mm. Whereas art is not like that. With art, you leave out the inessential stuff and include what is important. When I talk about this with my students, I like to give mm. the example about how some people just do not know how to tell an anecdote. They'll say, my uncle came over on Tuesday. Was it Tuesday? No, maybe it was Wednesday. No, it must have been Tuesday. And it's not even important, but they, they, they don't know how to edit out the unimportant stuff. And so toward the end of that novel, there's the scene where Rokantan listens to a blues song on a scratchy recording, mm. and he's moved by the beauty of it and has this sort of insight that this song has a kind of perfection. You know, every note really works, every inflection of the singer. And it doesn't matter that it's a scratchy record. You can, When you listen to it, you can tune out the scratchiness and mm -hmm. just focus on the music of it. And, and also, it, it wouldn't matter if that particular recording, I mean, if that particular record were destroyed. You know, there's a kind of you know, an essence there that transcends any physical manifestation and so on. So at that period in Sartre's career, he thought that was one of the great features of writing, that it could achieve this kind of sort of perfection that a human life could not. Although interestingly, that's something he moved away from later in his life. And in fact, there's kind of a scandalous, quote unquote, passage. I think it's from an interview later in his life where he says, compared to a dying child, nausea has no weight at all. You know, so so he came to the idea that the more important function of the writer is to disclose reality, to sort of point out what's going on. There's a passage in one of his works where he says, you know, if, if somebody's doing something wrong, but no one points it out, you know, it can be ignored. Or if there's some problem out there that's not being solved and no one points it out, you know, it can be ignored. So the writer's role, whether fiction or nonfiction, hmm. he thought part of the writer's role is to disclose reality, to sort of help us understand what is happening. And hmm. this also relates, I realize I'm rambling a bit. So one more oh, point, that's okay. I'll, let, no, that's fine. I'll let you back in. Um, in his book, What is Literature? He makes an interesting point about freedom in this connection, where he argues that the relation between writers and readers is a really good example of an authentic free relationship, mm. because writers need the freedom of readers to bring their work to life. Because when you write something, it's a bunch of black abstract shapes on white paper. You know, a reader has to actualize it. A reader has to decode it and think about what it means and make sense of it and so on. So, and this is a very free project. So writers need the freedom of readers. And readers also recognize that a, a piece of writing is something done freely, you know, by by an individual or, or it could be by a team of people, but 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 uh, a freely done. And moreover, uh, insofar as the writing makes a point or makes an argument, that is a non-coercive appeal to the reader's freedom and the reader's reason. You're not putting a gun to someone's head and say, look at it this way. It's like, I'm making a case for you, and now you are free to evaluate it and see whether it makes sense or not. So he sees the whole thing as kind of the paradigm of what human relationships should be like, this kind of free exchange where each recognizes the value of the other's freedom. Mm, mm. 
Um, I think kind of you passingly mentioned about this essence and and the existence. I think that 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 like famous quote like existence precedes essence. essence. Can you give us like more kind of you know more explaining kind of answer with some examples? What does it mean? And has it, is it a kind of puzzle? If you know this puzzle, then we can have more understanding about of our life as well. Well, I don't know if I would go that far. And I, I have to say, it's not my favorite way to get into Sartre. Sartre did a famous lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism, where that's sort of the way he did it. He talked about existence precedes essence. Um, but I'll talk about it a little bit. I, I mean, I think one way of thinking about it is it's just a formula for the idea of freedom mm. uh, that whatever you might say my essence is, it, it's sort of I'm never quite there yet because mm. I'm always sort of on the way uh, you know, you know at, at each moment. Uh, you, you know, there's there's an example. Let me interrupt that sentence and go at it this way. There's an example in being a nothingness that maybe is helpful here, uh, where he talks about a gambler who resolves not to gamble anymore. Mm. And then and, and then he sort of thinks, okay, I've resolved it. You know, I, I've made this resolution. I'm not going to gamble. It's fixed. It's finished. I'm now a non-gambler. And then he happens to come by a casino or whatever and suddenly realizes there's nothing stopping him from gambling. Uh, there's no barrier whatsoever. Mm. And uh, it says, in order for me to not gamble, I have to remake that resolution. I can't turn to that past resolution and have it decided for me. I have to do it all over again. I have to remember how I've disappointed my family, how I've, you know, the threat of economic ruin, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't sort of fix yourself. Oh, my essence is now I'm a non-gambler. It's always sort of in suspense. So we exist. That's here. That's here now. But our essence, I guess maybe we have that after we're dead. You know, then you can say, OK, uh, there's nothing more this person. Now we can kind of sum up what that person was. So mm. it's different from, you know, this pen. You know, this pen has a definite essence. It's been manufactured for precisely for the purpose of being used to write. You know, that's what it is. There's no ambiguity. It mm. doesn't stand at any distance from itself. It doesn't evaluate itself and make new. But but for us, whatever we are, our existence, as it were, uh, it always just provokes another question. You know, what 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 am I? What, what's my next move? It just uh, there's still this sort of open future at every stage. So I think that's the main thing he has in mind by saying that existence precedes uh, essence. Mm, mm. Um, so like if I ask you like I mean which is your favorite work by Sartre? Which one will you pick? You, you kind of tend to come back to like being in nothingness. Yeah, you know, uh, I I would say that if you are interested in Sartre's philosophy per se, that's pro and and you wanted to limit it to one book, that would probably be the one. I mean, that's a really big book. Uh, a lot there's a lot in there. The trouble with pinning Sartre down to one book, however, is that he worked in so many different genres. So you've got not only philosophical texts, you have novels, plays, short stories, biographies. He wrote a lot of really interesting biographies, a work of autobiography, lots of essays, lots of journalism. So there's lots of stuff. There really is. And so I think it would kind of depend on, uh, you know, if you're more interested in the philosophy or if you're more interested, you know, in the literary side. So if you were to go, to, so so for philosophy, I'd say being a nothingness. For literature, uh, nausea, which you mentioned, that's that's I think a really good book, a really interesting book. Plays the most popular one is No Exit. I don't know, are you familiar with that yeah. one? No, Ex that's probably the most popular one. It's uncharacteristic of Sartre in that it's very brief. It's a one act play that only takes about forty five minutes. And you know, Sartre yeah. he likes big long things. You know, yeah. uh, so so it's very unusual in that regard. Yeah. Um, 
And then later in his career, he did interesting stuff. So he's got one other big, massive philosophical book, and that's called Critique of Dialectical Reason, which came out in 1960. Mm. And um, that one is more on uh, economics, politics, sociology, those sorts of things, all sort of from a philosophical uh, perspective. So that's another really important one. Mm. You kind of touched like, no exit. I think that there's a one famous quote is like, um, hell is the other people. Yeah. And, and in that play, just, there are just three characters and they're condemned with this eternity to you know, live together and then they have to survive with each other. Um, I mean, it's, it's a kind of that kind of existential kind of classic thing, the whole, whole setting. Um, yes. Like what to learn from this? Like what are the things we can learn from this play? Yeah. So I think there are a couple of things and I'll get to those in just a second. But uh, just first, just a fun fact about that play. Okay. The way he came to write it is that he had three actor friends, two women and a man who approached him and said, hey, could you write a play for us? Oh and God. then <laughs> Sartre, Sartre wrote about this later, that the thought occurred to him that if if any one of them had a lot more lines than the others, you know, there would be a problem. So he wanted to come up with a way where they'd all be on stage for the same amount of time and have about the same number of lines. And so he got the idea, OK, maybe if they're in a room where they never exit. So he got the idea of no. Actually, the French title, no exit, wouldn't quite be the right translation. It would be more like in camera. But in any case, the English uh, no exit, so he got that idea. Uh, and then thought, hey, uh, how about if they're all in hell? Now, of course, Sartre was an atheist. He didn't believe in hell. So this is just a literary device. But now back to your question, what can we learn about it? So I think two things. One would be that if people are in bad faith, in fact, I guess both of them have to do with bad faith. So one would be just what bad faith is. And I'll come to that in a minute. But then mm -hmm. secondly, what human relationships are like if you're in bad faith. So a lot of people say, oh, he's got this sour view of human relations. Hell is other people. But in interviews, uh, Sartre has made it clear, well, that wasn't what I intended my message to be. You know, hell is other people for people like these, you know, people who are in bad faith. Mm -hmm. So in the play, so the way that the people are in bad faith, or at least two of them, I guess I should say, uh, are in bad faith in that they are in denial about the bad things that they did. Uh, so Garçon, the one character, uh, he was a coward and he doesn't want to admit that. Mm. Um, and so he goes out of his way to talk about other reasons why he's in hell. Uh, and he wants to sort of avoid that one. Mm. And he wants Estelle to reaffirm, you know, that, that oh yeah, yeah, no, you weren't a coward. You're really brave and so forth. And then mm. Inez is their witness to that. And she spoils it by saying, hey, you know, she's just saying that because she wants a man to admire her. She'll tell you anything. You know, so he so this is where we get into the bad faith human relations where people want the other to cast themselves in a favorable light and give them a kind of a fixed essence. So like in his case, mm. as a hero rather than a coward. Mm. Um, so that's kind of what is going on there. So uh, so like in the case of uh, Garçon, what he's he wants to say, well, I ran out of time. If I would have had more time, I would have done these sort of heroic things and so on. So they come up with these sort of pathetic excuses for the bad things that they did. And then they need the other to affirm that. And mm -hmm. so the relationships are based are based on bad faith. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why they're they're in hell. And in particular, that's why there are three people, because two people might be able to work out that kind of deal. I'll tell you pretty lies about you if you'll tell me pretty lies about me. But if there's a third person there who sees through it, you know, <laughs> then the whole thing sort of collapses. So I, th I think, uh, yeah, what lessons can we learn? We can learn about uh, how bad it is to... Mm make excuses for oneself rather than honestly facing up to you know what one's done and take responsibility for it mm -hmm. and this is not the way to pursue human relationships mm -hmm. you know?
because that kind of reminds me you know i'm kind of like i teach politics you know the way the political arena works in our world in the even in the western world so called you know developed countries you know uh, there are lots of bad faith there isn't it yeah. and 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 like so like if there are lots of bad faith that means it creates automatic hell for everyone yeah it yeah. makes sense i mean sure um and like especially like the american politics as well it's quite toxic it's like every day you know like something <laughs> you know like this is bad faith politics <laughs> oh oh yeah c- c- completely i mean american politics it's just it's just mind blowing how 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 bad it is um and and and, and yes the the dishonesty mm. i mean just here i'll just give you one example what just sort of clearly illustrating this so um when obama was president at a certain point there was a vacancy in the supreme court mm. and it was something like 11 months before the next election but the opposition party was in control of senate and they mm. said oh well we're not going to have hearings we're going to leave that seat vacant because there's a presidential election coming up we'll let people vote for who they want to be president and then that person will be able to name the new justice which of course doesn't make any sense. You know, there's the vacancy now. There already was an election where Obama was like, you know, so it should just proceed. But they they sort of pretended. Here's where the bad faith is. Oh no, there's an election coming up. We've got to let the people mm-hmm. decide. Let the so then what happens is when there was a vacancy under a Republican president, uh, Trump, and there was much less time. <laughs> the next election, oh, we've got to fill that seat. You know. So, so not even any attempt to be sort of logically or morally uh, consistent. And yet, of course, they don't admit that either. Like if they're asked a question about the inconsistency, they just sort of deflect or something like that. So just a massive amount of just straight out, maybe it sh- shouldn't even be called bad faith. Maybe it's just really just simple lying because bad faith implies you're kind of lying to yourself. So maybe it's not so much a bad faith problem; it's just a flat-out lying problem, you know. But anyway, okay. Um, like what else? Um, like in terms of your our day-to-day life, I mean, how important, like Satra, in terms of like you know the philosophical understanding of our life, and and like to become a bit more calm and you know like more like reflective of our existence rather than you know like just frustrated about you know the other people or the things going on around us i mean does you know, that has got some kind of prescription there so 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 yeah that's a really good question so uh, let me think about how i might want to answer it so part of it would be uh a Sartrean perspective would encourage you to think about what is important. So like we were we were both having a good time at the beginning of this conversation complaining about um, academic politics. Yeah. And so one thing I notice with a lot of these administrators mm. is they will do things that I'm sure they know are are wrong. You know, things that maybe go against uh, our school's constitution or go against the principle of faculty governance, but they do it because uh, if they didn't, they would be fired. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll carry water for those above them who want to do these sorts of things. Hmm. And so my thought is, you know, if they were fired from that job, they would still have a faculty position and still make a very adequate salary. It would be a lower salary and so they're like prioritizing their higher position and their higher salary over being a fair and decent person. Mm. And I, I doubt if they themselves conceptualize it that way. Um, so a Sartrean perspective would be, you know, you've got to think about what you're doing uh, and what's really important. You know, is it important in life to to make I mean, obviously, we all need to make a certain amount of money. You've got to, you know, have you've got to be able to have a roof over your head and have food to eat, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But, but you know, once you have a decently comfortable living, is it really more important to have even more money if the cost is you're going to do nasty things to people and break rules and so on? 
Uh, so that's the kind of thing that I think Sartre would encourage us to think about. And, and then also getting back to this earlier point about those who passively follow others. Mm. There's a point I like to make with my students, not just when I'm talking about Sartre, but in general, mm. that there are some things in life where maybe it makes sense to kind of let other people make decisions for you if it's something that requires special technical knowledge that you don't have. So maybe if your car breaks down, you find a trusted mechanic to fix it for you. And maybe you find a trusted dentist, you know, to do things for your teeth. But when it comes to questions like, what is important? What do I stand for? What are my principles? How should I spend my time in life? You don't want to farm that out to somebody else, because if you do, you're living someone someone else's life. You know, mm. so if you're just kind of doing what is expected of a person like you in your society, you know, you're kind of not living your life. So that's a Sartrean thing that maybe would make a difference. And then the final one I'll mention is just to circle back to something I said before about the importance of having projects in life that have some depth to them that give you continuous satisfaction as you get deeper and deeper into them. So I mentioned like the arts are really good for this, you know, music, painting, whatever it might be, and uh, intellectual pursuits as well, science, philosophy. And so even if you don't do that professionally, even if you're not a professional artist or a professional philosopher or a professional scientist, these are things you can do that will give your life meaning. You know, thinking for yourself about important questions, political questions, questions about life and what's important. And so, you know, thinking about those things, reading about those things, Um and again, in, in, in politics, it's very important to do that. I mean, the idea of democracy supposedly is, you know, that everyone is participating. So, you know, being a critical thinker, where critical means uh, you are evaluating claims to determine whether they are true or whether they are plausible or not. You know, that's something that gives life meaning and is important politically as well. So those are a few, few things I would highlight. Mm. Um, do you've got couple of more minutes, David. Sure. Um, I'm just trying to touch some of his political activism as well. Yes. Uh, so like some of the things he just mentioned about, I mean, which is linked to it, like, you know, like the way the society is, especially the capitalism, you know, the how the bourgeois society, uh, even when you talk about art, music, you know, like lots of people don't have access to those things. You know, the, the You're way. right. Yeah. Um, and I think in his own life, I think he's, stopped writing play later part of his life because he thought that plays are just for the like kind of you know rich people you know <laughs> uh, the, the their their entertainment you know um so so his idea about you know the the society more fair society can actually make us like more free like for for everyone yeah so the capitalism works it only makes the super rich people free yes yeah so so here's a point in Sartre that I think is is underappreciated, and it's something in my own work I've really emphasized, mm. is in being a nothingness, he distinguishes between two different senses of freedom. So one he calls freedom of choice. That's the one where everyone is condemned to be free, no matter what your situation, even if you're a slave in chains. This is one of his scandalous statements. He, he said, a slave in chains is free. But he made it clear, free only in that sense of freedom of choice, no matter what your situation is, even the most deprived mm. sort of situation, there are still choices to be made. So if you're a slave, you have the choice of trying to escape and revolt, or maybe instead a choice of trying to make the best of that situation and other choices as well. So that's freedom of choice. But then there's also what he calls freedom of obtaining where it means something like you are more free the more you have uh, available means and opportunity to realize important chosen goods, something like that. So mm. in that sense, the slave is very much unfree. Mm. The poor are relatively unfree, just as you say, you know, the rich are free, the poor much less so. Mm. 
And Sartre makes it clear, especially in his later writings, that he sees these two ideas as connected, that that you know, the ultimate goal, sort of the, the good life, is one in which people richly have freedom in that second sense. They really have lots of meaningful choices they can make to pursue a variety of the good things of life. Um, and so part of the tragedy, uh, to sort of put the two things together, the two senses of freedom together, part of the tragedy of people who don't have that, people who are slaves or prisoners or impoverished, is it is free beings who are being oppressed. So there's a passage where he says, one does not oppress a stone. You know, you can do anything, <laughs> lock a stone in prison, it's no tragedy, you know. Um, so so you have to understand the prisoner and the slave as being free in that metaphysical sense, if you will, in order to understand what oppression is in this kind of pol political sense. So uh, getting back to your point about what's going on in his later works, in his later works, he really emphasizes that sense of freedom. There's a passage where he says something like, to me, freedom means having more than one pair of shoes, you know, stuff like that. Um, uh, and so, you know, uh, so both of those things are kind of relevant. Uh, going back to the bad faith thing, we need to not deny the freedom of choice that we have mm -hmm. and we also need to work for a world in which everyone has much greater freedom of obtaining than mm -hmm. the poor and the oppressed have now Th those are sort of how those two things fit together mm. and like one last point i mean because i mean yeah. we we dealt quite deep stuff i mean any any fun humorous thing about john paul Sartre? Okay, I, I've got oh, a humorous yeah. one for you. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, at one point, Sartre had part had participated in some political thing. I don't remember what it was, but he had done something political, and mm. it was it was in the media. You know, among the people involved in this protest or whatever it is, you know, Jean Paul Sartre, and uh, in the FBI files. Hmm. Somebody got this like through the Freedom of Information Act or what have you. That, that clipping was there. And in J. Edgar Hoover's own handwriting, he had written, find out who Sard is. <laughs> and I think like FBA has got a huge pile on, on him because he was meeting people like, you know, Castro, Chigurh, right. you know. <laughs> Well, the FBI, they, they kept files. It's so ridiculous. They, <laughs> they also really kept files on musicians. And, you know, anyone who plays a guitar and sings a song, you know, they've got a file. And uh, I read a book one time. Uh, it was called something like Rock Musicians and the FBI, where somebody threw the Freedom of Information Act and got the FBI files on dead musicians. You can't get living people without their permission, but dead people are in the public domain. And the one on John Lennon, the, the it, huge, huge file on John Lennon. And my favorite part was they had a quotation from one of his song lyrics, but they blacked out some of the lyrics because of national security. <laughs> so it was, all we are saying is blank, 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 blank. So they they, they blacked out, give peace a chance. That, that threatens uh, national security. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um... So David, thank you so much again. No, um, but I mean you are one of the persons I will try to bring it be back again and again. You know. Oh well, thank you. This is it's, it's for you know. I think I don't know. Like as far as this is for my own mental health as well. <laughs> the, <laughs> well, the, thank you for saying that. That the angst we are going through. You know, like sometimes we need to unpack some of our. You know, this uh, like anguish. I mean, we are going through. Thank you so much, David. And then I, I, you are you are you're a great friend of mine. You're a great philosopher. So you know, um, and I think you know whenever I'm in a kind of this kind of moral conundrum, I'll come back to you. And well, then, thank you for that. And we'll you. Have I, I feel the same. I feel the same about you. I really appreciate you these so conversations. Much. Thank you so much. Okay, you are a good man, David. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate so much. that. Okay, so I'll see you soon again. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.